Again, it is a pleasure to stand in your presence and discuss with you the Word of God. We're discussing again this evening, the Scriptures teach that water baptism is for in order to obtain the remission of sins. Mr. Watson had a good deal to say about salvation by grace, and salvation by faith, and salvation by the blood. If you remember, the very first argument I made is that a man is saved by faith. But the question is, when is a man saved by faith? Mr. Watson, I believe that a man is saved by faith. When is a man saved by faith is the issue. That is what we're discussing. I believe that a man is saved by grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Does that mean everyone's saved? Titus said God's grace has appeared unto all men. But... The Bible also says it's teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Yes, we're saved by grace, but how does man appropriate the grace of God? That's what we're looking at. Mr. Watson made a statement that repentance and faith are the inseparable graces. I'm glad I found out something about these people in John 12. I always thought these men were against Christ because they wouldn't confess it. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed. I guess that means they also repented of their sin. They wouldn't confess Christ. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many also repented and believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, these spineless people would not confess him. Be saved in Mr. Watson. If repentance and faith are inseparable graces, we just got these people in John 12 into heaven. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. These people are going to be in heaven, aren't they? According to the reasoning of my friend. He talked a little bit. He started off by saying, you know, you said a lot about us Baptists. And he said he's not really a Baptist. Mr. Watson, why don't you make it plain for us? He said the Baptist church is not the ecclesia. I guess that means the Baptist church is not the church that you read of in Ephesians 5 that Christ is going to save. I've always thought that. The Baptist church is not the church spoken of in Ephesians 5. But tell us more about that. Mentioned a lot about Mr. Campbell, and I, from the people that know me, I've never quoted Mr. Campbell on anything. I think he is wrong on several things. You read his autobiography, and you're one up on me. I never have. In fact, I didn't even think he wrote an autobiography, Frank. I didn't know anything about it. But I'll tell you what, I've never gone back to Campbell for anything. We're here to discuss the Scriptures. The Scriptures teach water baptism is for in order to obtain the remission of sins. Remember that chart we had up here on Hebrews chapter 11? By faith, Moses. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. Remember he talked about the people back in Israel that they looked upon the serpent. Frank, who had to do the looking? By faith only they were healed when the serpents were out in the camp. They just sat down in their tent said, I have faith in God. Who had to get up and look, Frank? Who had to get up out of the tent, go down to the middle of the camp and look upon the serpent? Is that faith only? Saved at the point of faith? We'll find out more about that later. Remember the chart we have? Baptism is always before salvation. Y'all remember what he said about it? Now, I'm in the affirmative this evening. That means I give the arguments and he responds. What did he say about this chart? Five passages. Baptism always comes first. Y'all feeling we're going to get a good speech on this in a little bit. <laughs> well, I can't respond to it tonight. But what did he say about this? Did he make an argument about it? Did he mention it at all in his speech? Mark chapter 16. We found out some interesting things about Mark 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He said, you know what's like this? He that believeth, or he that gets on the bus and sits down will arrive in Los Angeles. He that gets on the bus and stands up will arrive in Los Angeles. But you know what he really believes about it? Try to make a parallel. He that gets on the bus is already in Los Angeles. <laughs> he that gets on the bus is already there whether he sits down or not. <laughs> he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You know, there's a rule in Indiana. You have to have your seatbelt on if you're sitting in the front seat. He that sitteth down and puts a seatbelt on is going to drive safely. But you know, you can drive your car without it. You don't have to have a seatbelt on, but you're breaking the law. God had a law. He had a rule. Jesus gave a command. Is this an optional command? Did Jesus go around saying, well, you know, if you kind of like it, go ahead. But if not, you know, it's only to get you into the Baptist church. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We ask the question, what does Mr. Watson believe? Believes both of them. Believes both of them. Doesn't make any difference. Or not. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's what the Lord said. Mr. Watson said, that's fine. Or if you want to take the other view, you know, whichever side you want, I'd be glad to go either direction. Very interesting position. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, we read Acts 2.38. 
Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And Frank made some arguments. I want you to remember this. He said that there's a difference in person and number between repent and be baptized. He said, you've got to remember the commas. Frank, did you know in the New Testament Greek that they didn't have commas? The commas were put in by the English translators. In the Greek New Testament, they didn't have commas in Acts 2.38. The commas were put in by the English translators. But even so, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. We asked the question, when were the people saved in Acts 2? Now, I want you to remember this. He said, well, I guess when they believed and repented. We're going to come back to that in a minute. We ask, when were they saved? Were they saved when they were pricked in the heart? And I've always thought that meant that they believed. Peter commanded them to believe. Then the Bible says they were pricked in the heart. I thought that meant they believed. Did you know what these believers asked? Go to the next chart there, Rob. Listen as we read the passage. Therefore, this is the end of Peter's sermon, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assure that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both the Lord and Christ. He tells them right here, you believe. No, they sure. You believe. Were they saved then when they were commanded to believe? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart. I believe that's when, it, when they believed, right there. That's what most Baptists talk about. You know that feeling in your heart? They were pricked in the heart. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Do for what? Do for what? Men and brethren, what shall we do? But they're saying, men and brethren, now that we're already saved, what shall we do? Is that it? Or do you think these people realized they crucified the Son of God and wanted to know how to escape the condemnation that came upon them? Peter said, repent. And remember when Mr. Watson said that faith and repentance are inseparable graces of God? They're inseparable, then they repented back up here, didn't they? If faith and repentance are inseparable, if you can't separate them, these people are saved back up in verse 37, and Peter was wasting time in verse 38. And these people were told to believe. And after they believed, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Were they believers when they were told to repent and be baptized? Were they? I think they were believers. Told to repent and be baptized. If they weren't believers at this point, if they weren't believers in verse 37, why were they cut to the heart? If cut to the heart isn't belief, what does it mean? It'd be real interesting, don't you think? Don't you think it'd be good if Mr. Watson would get up here and say, yes, that is belief, or no, it's not. But if he says, no, it's not belief, what does it mean? If repentance and faith are inseparable graces of God, what does pricked in the heart mean? These people weren't believers. Why do you suppose they asked, what shall we do? Can you imagine a bunch of unbelievers saying, what are we supposed to do? A bunch of unbelievers didn't believe in Christ, but what shall we do? Pricked in the heart. Ask men and brethren. Watch. You know, if, if pricked in the heart doesn't mean they believe. Frank, why didn't he tell them to believe? You know, pricked in the heart doesn't mean believe. This looks like Peter messed up. <laughs> if pricked in the heart, if that doesn't mean believe, Peter forgot to tell him to believe somewhere along the way. Well, maybe he'll come back and answer this. Maybe he'll talk about it. We had a picture of a train. Mr. Watson, there was the word and. A conjunction joins two words together. He said that not everyone had to be baptized. You know, the general command, I believe, is to repent, but some of you can be baptized. Mr. Watson, the conjunction and joins two things together. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. He tried to take it apart on you. We asked which direction was this train going. Mr. Watson, whatever direction repentance is going, baptism is going the same way. If these people were told to repent in order to obtain the remission of sins, they were told to be baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. If they were told you'd be baptized because you're already saved, you know what? He said you repent because you're already saved. Whatever direction the train's going, those were both boxcars, one way or the other. Not a little word and, it's a very small word. Mighty small. The word sin's a small word too. Bring damnation upon the world. The word not. Remember what the serpent told Eve, thou shalt not surely die. It's a small word. The word and's a small word. What did he do about it? Go on to the next chart. Um, 
Mr. Watson mentioned A.T. Robertson, Spiro Zodiates, but he forgot to tell you one thing about Mr. Robertson. <laughs> Mr. Robertson was a Baptist. <laughs> Don't you think that somehow he just kind of forgot to tell you he was a Baptist? <laughs> Mr. Zodiates, you know something else about him? He forgot to tell you he is a Baptist too. <laughs> Wonder why he forgot to tell you that they were Baptist. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, the, those words, repent and be baptized, they're different, person and number. And therefore, they can't be referring to the same thing. I was hoping we could avoid the discussion on this. It would be a lot easier, I think, for everyone. Mr. Watson, this is a part of a handbook given to every person in the United Bible Society that translates the Bible into foreign languages, given in Africa, South America, throughout the world. Now, you said that they're different in person and number, therefore they can't be referring to the same thing. That phrase, so that your sins will be forgiven, literally into a forgiveness of sins, in Greek may express either purpose or result, but the large majority of translators understand it as indicating purpose, so that your sins will be forgiven. Is it because of the remission of sins or in order to obtain? So sometimes a few people say what means because of it. Notice the last phrase. This phrase or the phrase modifies both main verbs, Turn away from your sins, repent, and be baptized. Mr. Watson, this book's given to every translator, every Greek scholar in the world for the United Bible Society. A lot of Baptists in that society. Everyone in the world gets a copy of the book on Acts. When they translate it into whatever language they might be, it says that the phrase is for both repent and be baptized. Whatever repentance is for and Acts 2.38, baptism is for. Don't let him get up here and escape the issue. What is baptism for? It's the same thing repentance is for. If baptism is, if you repent and be baptized because you're already saved, it means you repent because you're already saved. It makes a very interesting thing. Maybe he'll come back to that. But you know, I asked, I thought about this question. And I wrote an, an, a letter a couple years ago to F.W. Gingrich. Gingrich, a man, with a, a man uh, by the name of Arndt, Arndt and Gingrich, gave us a Greek lexicon. And the phrase that Mr. Watson used a few minutes ago, he said they're different in person and number. Repent and be baptized. Therefore, they can't refer to the same thing. I asked one of the greatest Greek scholars in the world specifically on this passage. I asked, is it grammatically possible that the phrase Esophis and Hamartia, that, sorry about that, that's for the forgiveness of sins. Is it possible that for the forgiveness of sins, as used in Acts 2.38, expresses the force of both verbs, repent and be baptized, each one of you, even though these verbs differ in person and number. I know they're different in person and number. But does the phrase, for the forgiveness of sins, apply to both repent and be baptized? Now, you said, no, it doesn't. Well, Mr. Gingrich had a different idea. <laughs> to read, if you can read the, the statement there, and I'll substitute the English word here. He said, the difference in person and number between repent and be baptized is caused by the fact that repent is a direct address in the second person plural, while be baptized is governed by the subject. Every one of you. That's Echistos down here. Every one of you, of course, is a collective noun. He's saying all of these people, collective, all of them had to do what this passage says. Repent and be baptized. Now, Mr. Watson, you're free to call for this chart. And all the others, all the others we've used, we've told you about it. Wrote the same letter to uh, Bruce Metz. He's from the United Bible Society. He teaches at Princeton Theological Seminary. He's responsible for many of the translations. If you have something besides the King James translation, one of the versions used in the last few years. Mr. Metzger probably had a part in the making of the tra translation. I ask, is it possible again that repent and be baptized if they are both going to the same object for the remission of sin? He said in reply to your recent inquiry, may I say that in my view the phrase for the remission of sins in Acts 2.38 applies in sense to both the preceding verbs. Yes, Mr. Watson, that's what we've been saying. Remember the train. Yet forget about the letters. Remember the train. What direction is the train going? Repent and be baptized because of the remission of sins, or repent and be baptized in order to obtain. Wrote another letter. John Warner, Greek scholar, man that preaches, uh, not real preaches, but he's on the uh, Wycliffe uh, Bible translators, the Wycliffe Bible Society, group of people that have gotten together. They're not uh, members of any particular church. All they want to do is spread the word of God throughout the world. And so they print copies of the Bible in other languages. And sometimes you go into foreign countries, like in China, they have to translate it into, into new languages that had not been translated into before. I asked him the question. And his response was, whenever two verbs, repent and be baptized, are connected by chi, and, and then followed by a modifier, such as a prepositional phrase in Acts 2.38, 38, 
It grammatically is possible that the modifier modifies either both verbs or only the latter. Mr. Watson said, no, it can't be both of them. Well, he said, yes, it was, like everyone else. This is because there are no, there is no punctuation in the ancient manuscripts. Mr. Watson got up here and made a big deal about the, the commas in Acts 2.38. There weren't any commas when Luke, the historian, wrote Acts 2.38, Mr. Watson. No commas there. He said, so we don't know whether the author intended to pause between the first verb and the end. It does not matter here in Acts 2.38. One of the verbs is second person plural, and the other is third person singular. Mr. Watson said, yeah, it makes a lot of difference there. Everyone else, every translator in the world said, no, it doesn't make a difference. They are both imperative. And the fact that they are joined by and is sufficient evidence that the author may have regarded them as a single unit to which his modifier applies. Real quickly, one other. Arthur Farstead from Thomas Nelson. If you have a Bible out there, you might look on the edge of it. It says, Thomas Nelson Publishing Company. He gave you the New King James translation of the Bible. This guy's executive editor. Since the expression for the remission of sins is a prepositional phrase with no verbal endings or singular or plural endings, I would certainly agree that grammatically it can go with both repentance and baptism. In fact, I think that it does go with both of them. Exactly what the interpretation is is another question. He's saying that whatever repentance is for in Acts 2.38, baptism is for. That's what we'll try to get across. Whatever repentance is for, baptism is for. Now, Mr. Watson, get up here and tell us. Does a man repent because he's already saved? Does he repent in order to obtain the remission of sins? Now, I hope he doesn't dodge this. I hope he comes up here. Well, let's go on to a couple other uh, charts on John's baptism. John's baptism. <clears throat> he had a little bit to say about the baptism of John. Well, Mr. Watson believes in some sort of baptism. I wish he'd get up here and tell us what it is for. If it's not for the remission of sins, what is baptism for? I want you to notice a couple things about John's baptism. Why was it uh, that Jesus was baptized? In the book of John, chapter 1, verses 31 through 34, Jesus, or the, the Bible says, that he was baptized, not for the remission of sins, but to manifest to Israel that he was the Messiah. Jesus was not baptized for the remission of sins. Jesus had no sins. Well, I want you to notice a few things about the baptism of John. And see if the baptism of John is in any way similar to the baptism of Watson. Turn your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. And he came into all the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But I also noticed something else about John's baptism. In the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, those people that came to be baptized by John that baptism was preceded by a confession of sins. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Then went out to, to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region about Jordan, and were baptized in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, Mr. Watson, get the point. When people came to John the Baptist to be baptized, they came confessing their sins. We're going to talk more about that in a few moments. But I also notice in the book of John chapter 3, that the baptism of John the Baptist accomplished purification. In John chapter 3, verses 22 through 26. And after these things, Jesus and his disciples, uh, came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. John was also baptizing in Enon near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was yet not cast into prison. And then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. About, was it purification of the flesh? I suppose they were talking about how to make the body clean. It was a purification of the soul. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. I'll come back to that in a few moments. But also notice in John's baptism, to accept John's baptism was to justify God. In the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 29 and 30, And all the people that heard him, and all the publicans, justified God being baptized with, uh, with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized. To accept John's baptism was to justify God. What does it mean to justify God? It means to pronounce just, absolutely right. 
When the people were baptized by John, they were simply saying what God said is true. But then I want you to notice one other thing. John 7 and verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. To refuse the baptism of John was to reject the counsel of God. You know, over in the Hebrew letter, the Bible tells us, See then that you do not refuse him who speaks from heaven. You know, if a man refused the baptism of John, he rejected the counsel of God. What is it if a man refuses the baptism of Christ? Any penalty attached to that? Uh, usually over uh, one part at a time, Rob. Let's go through one point at a time in this next chart, if you have something to place over it. I want you to notice that three classes of people came to John the Baptist. First of all, there were some people who came confessing their sins. And what did John do to these people? He said, get down on your knees until you have the experience of grace. <laughs> and John, people came to John confessing their sins, and John said, just keep on praying the sinner's prayer and maybe you'll pray to him. <laughs> people came confessing their sins, and you know what? John baptized these people without question. Mr. Watson, is that what you do? When people come to Watson to be baptized, do they come confessing their sins? Do they come confessing, I don't have any sins already forgiven? But you know, there are some other people that came to John. There were people that we read of in Matthew chapter 3, the Pharisees and the lawyers. Notice what the Bible said about these people when they came to John the Baptist. They claimed that they were already saved. Open your Bible with me there real quickly. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Matthew 3, 7 through 9. But when, the, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, there must have been some connection between the baptism of John and fleeing from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And do not uh, say uh, within yourselves, We have Abraham for our fathers. For I say to you that God is able these stones to raise up children to Abraham. The Pharisees and lawyers, they came to John, but you know what? They weren't confessing their sins. They came confessing their salvation. They said, we've already been saved. John refused to baptize people that claimed they were already saved. The people that came confessing their sins, John baptized without question. Mr. Watson, is that the way you do it? You baptize people when they are confessing their sins or confessing their salvation. But there was a third class. third class came to, to uh, John. The sinless Son of God. Read in your Bible. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. And Jesus said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Suffer. Allow it to be so now. The idea of now is, the definition is, at this very time, this one time, this moment. Denoting strictly present time. Just this one time. Here came Jesus. Jesus was the exception of the two up here. Jesus had no sins. Now the other people that claimed they were already saved, John wasn't baptized them. But here came the sinless Son of God. John said, I don't have a need. Jesus said, suffer. Allow it. Suffer it this one time. Jesus was the exception to the rule. The only sinless person that ever came to John. John didn't want to be, did not want to baptize. But Jesus said, you suffer. You allow it this one time. And Mr. Watson, you tell us, do you baptize people confessing their sins? People confessing their salvation. If to reject the baptism of John was to reject the counsel of God, what is it to reject the baptism which Jesus Christ commands? Will you classify yourselves among the willfully disobedient? Or will you be among the humble men of the earth who will bow to the will of God and be justified by obedience to the will of God? Open your Bible with me to the book of Acts, chapter 10. Mr. Watson read one verse and didn't read the rest of the story. Maybe he'll come up here and tell us some more about it. In Acts, chapter 10, you find the story of a man by the name of Cornelius, a Roman centurion in charge of a hundred soldiers. Cornelius was a devout man. I've only got four minutes. I've got to go through this real fast. Cornelius was a devout man, a religious man, an honorable man, one that prayed to God often. 
gave alms to the poor. As we read in verses 1 and 2. He saw a vision as we read in verse 3. An angel of God appeared unto him. How many Baptist preachers in this town would say after he saw the angel he didn't have to do anything else. The angel said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. and Your alms have come up for a memorial. How many preachers in this town would say, well, he's already a saved man. The angel said that God heard his prayers. But you know what the angel told him? You send down to Joppa. 30 miles away, you call for one Simon Peter. And he will tell the words. He will tell the words. Whereby thou and all thy house might be saved. So the next day he sent his soldiers. I sent a soldier and two servants down. And Peter came back. And preached a sermon unto this man. And notice what he says. <coughs> Verses 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now there's a sermon recorded from verses 36 and following. I don't know how much of that Peter preached before the Holy Spirit came. In Acts chapter 11, when Peter retells the story, he said, as I began to speak, meaning I had just said one or two words, the Holy Spirit came. Mr. Watson, will you tell us what that meant when the Holy Spirit came? Was it a sign of salvation? And if so, is that the way you do it today? Do you wait for people to be baptized with the Holy Spirit before you, before you will immerse them in water? Never heard of Baptist churches waiting for people to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Speak in tongues to magnify God. But Mr. Watson, why don't you get up here and tell us? And after the Holy Spirit came as a sign that God would accept the Gentiles. Read the rest of the story. Verse 44, And while Peter spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them, on all of them that heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as had come with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then he prayed there, uh, then prayed there, uh, they him to tarry uh, certain days. I want you to notice a couple things about this. Thank you. When was Cornelius saved? Was he saved when he was praying? When he prayed the sinner's prayer? <laughs> was he prayed when the angel appeared unto him? You know, I can make just as good an argument that he was saved when the Holy Spirit came as I could that he was saved when the angel came. Was he saved when Peter began his sermon? Was he saved when the Holy Spirit came? Or was he saved when he obeyed the command? He commanded them to be baptized. Mr. Watson, how many people do you command to be baptized? You know, Jesus never gave optional commands. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, a passage we already read. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. He commanded them to be baptized. Mr. Watson, what would have happened if he would have refused to obey the command given by an apostle of our Lord? I hope you'll get up here and tell us. When was Cornelius saved? I pray that all of us will think about these things. Come back tomorrow night with your Bible. Study Mark 16, 16. Study Acts 2, 38. Study Acts 10. Next 22.16. Five passages we had at the beginning. Which comes first, baptism or salvation? Why doesn't he get up here and talk about those things? I pray that we'll be able to study again tomorrow night. pray that you'll listen to my opponent. May God give grace to the right.